Imagine that you possessed a valuable secret. If you were determined to keep it, you could fight. Or, like the ancient Arabs, you could adopt a different ploy. Their secret was the origin of cinnamon. The Arabs put about wild and fantastic tales of a terrifying land of giant birds who built their nests high up on cliffs too tall for men to climb. The birds built the nests of cinnamon branches and according to the Arabs, the trick was to set bait below the cliffs. The birds carried it to their nests, the nests were unable to stand the weight and the cinnamon came crashing down to the ground. Sri Lanka, cinnamon's real source, and a lure for conquerors from abroad. These people suffered subjugation by the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the British, all who came seeking cinnamon. Today the invaders are gone, but the cinnamon remains and is just as important. Thousands of tons of the spice are exported round the world each year. The end product is a precisely tailored meter-long stick of bark known as a quill of cinnamon. Mexico uses more Sri Lankan cinnamon than anyone, and it's a fair exchange. Mexico is the home of the chili pepper, which nearly 500 years ago transformed the cooking of India and Sri Lanka. Now, Mexican market stalls sell these elegant quills alongside piles of fiery local chilies. Mexicans have a sweet tooth. The cinnamon's special role, amongst the spices, is to complement sweetness. For instance, Mexican rice pudding is unthinkable without cinnamon sticks added during cooking. In general, the Mexicans favor the spice in its quill form. However, to emphasize the flavor, ground cinnamon and sugar is spooned onto each dish at the table. Mm. Mm. Hot chocolate, too, comes with plenty of ground cinnamon, plus a piece of bark provided as a stirrer. Cinnamon is the sugar-loving spice. It acts as a bridge between the bitterness of the raw chocolate and the sweetness of the sugar. Add crushed almonds and egg yolk, and the hot chocolate slides down very well. the Austrian Alps, a winter playground of mountains, spas, and something else very special. More than any other Europeans, the Austrians have always treasured cinnamon. They use it in hot drinks and spicy cakes, better here than anywhere else. Cinnamon brings warmth to cold. These slopes, high above the resort town of Badischl, guard a shrine down below, a shrine to the art of Austrian baking. Even the last mighty emperor of Central Europe and his entourage ate the cakes of Zona. This innocent pile of sour green apples is the clue to the speciality of the house. The brightest jewel in a crown of jewels. Even the most demanding customer waits. It needs a fine pastry 
a masterpiece of molding, bending, stretching, caressing. This pastry must be thin enough to read a love letter through. Franz Joseph himself would approve. His empire is now gone, but so long as there is sugar, cinnamon, apples, raisins, and fine pastry, there will always be apple strudel. And, of course, the waltz. Austria, you don't only come across apple strudel in fine restaurants. The tradition is part of every home. The Plumberger household is a perfect example of domestic productivity. Herr Plumberger makes violins. Frau Plumberger creates in the kitchen. Strudel pastry is difficult, and don't be fooled by people who claim it's easy. Handling the dough with such care that not a tear appears is a job for an expert. True, the Austrians hold an advantage. Their flour is made for stretchy pastry. Here in Strudel land, all sorts of fillings are acceptable. But for this cook, it's always apples. The sliced apples, stripped of their peels, are tipped into breadcrumbs and sugar. Frau Plumberger uses only the greenest and sharpest fruit. And there. A scattering of raisins, tiny sweet bites amongst the sour apples. And then the spice, zimped to the Austrians, derived perhaps from saying cinnamon too quickly. This spice has always been the bridge between opposing tastes, especially in medieval times when all ingredients, whether sweet or savory, stewed together in the same pot. Now, how to make this strudel a strudel. The tablecloth is an essential prop. As Frau Plamberger lifts and pulls, the filling disappears wrapped in many layers of pastry. She even makes slipping her fluffy parcel onto a baking tray look easy. And she gives it a reassuring pat. All that's needed now is a final brush with butter. No doubt aroused by spicy smells from the kitchen, Herr Plamberger is inspired to play a little song for his supper. He fiddles while she strudels. Actually, there is some room for doubt about the source of his inspiration. Three quarters of an hour later, Frau Plamberger knows her strudel is ready. It is, as always is, a perfect, buttery, crisp confection of apples and spice. A dusting with the finest sugar, white sugar, and that adds a final touch. Some say it shouldn't be cut until cold, but in this household, that is not the rule. I mean, it's just too good to leave. And there it is, a perfect Austrian cameo. Snow outside, indoors a small reflection of this country's love of music, domesticity, and spicy pastries. The outskirts of Kyoto, Japan's old capital. A Shinto festival, one of many, attracts both local people and visitors.
This cart is a shrine to the souls of those worthy of special remembrance. For the young men, another common ritual theme, purification by physical effort. Cinnamon, the signpost to yet another sweet delicacy. The dough will become the traditional sweet biscuits, katsuhashi. They are baked in their millions. As a souvenir of Kyoto, every visitor takes away a box of yatsuhashi. Cinnamon provides the pleasant flavor and brown color. The mixture is rolled flat, cut into rectangles, weighted down and baked. It is then shaped to resemble Japan's classical stringed instrument, the koto. In fact, the biscuit is a memorial to the distinguished koto player, Yatsuhashi Kenyo. But take care, other temptations lure the visitor. Fresh yatsuhashi. An envelope of soft dough wraps a sweet red bean paste center. If the proof is in the eating, the Kyoto children don't mind at all. Sri Lankans harvest cinnamon as if time had stopped. Long ago, they discovered that the best spice comes from the inner bark of young succulent shoots like these. If left alone, they would grow into trees 10 or 15 meters high. This man started cutting just after first light. He is one of a family of contract workers. They move from plantation to plantation harvesting. Often their work day lasts 13 hours. After cutting enough branches for a day's work, they carry them back to the plantation hut, a wadi, where the rest of the family waits and works. After youngsters strip away the coarse outer bark, the valuable inner bark is rubbed with brass tools to loosen it. The men actually separate the cinnamon bark from the central wooden stalks. They use only brass or stainless steel knives. Anything else discolors the fragile spice. It is likely that thousands of years ago, the ancient Malays harvested and prepared cinnamon just like this. They called the spice sweet wood. In their language, Kayumain. The name journeyed far to the biblical Hebrews and on to the Phoenicians who gave it to Europe. The quilling is done by the women of the family. It's a bit like making a cigar. Bark is lined in a row. A particularly good length is filled with smaller pieces and rolled into shape. Nothing is wasted. Every quilling and chip has a place. Long ago, quills crossed the Indian Ocean. They were cherished first by the Egyptians and later the Romans. It is difficult to believe that still today, every stick of cinnamon used is the result of so much hand labor. When quills are finished, they are neatly trimmed into a standard length of just over a meter and hung in the roof of the wadi to dry. Direct sunlight would twist them. It is in this form that quills are exported to the world. Usually grinding or further processing happens abroad. Also to the ancients, cinnamon leaves were the exotic and valuable spice malabatrum. Today, Sri Lankans extract oil from them. The method is steam distillation. Cinnamon leaf oil is rich in eugenol, the chemical which makes a dentist's office smell healthy. The oil is also used in soaps, cosmetics, processed foods, toothpaste. And there might even be a bit in ice cream or the favorite cola. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou principal spices of myrrh and of sweet cinnamon. Thou shalt make of it a holy oil to anoint the ark of the testimony. Cassia was also commanded. Cinnamomum cassia, as its Latin name suggests, was another type of cinnamon. 
These spices were known in biblical times. But where did they come from? Cinnamon travelled across the oceans from the east, but cassia nobody knows. The Arabs have left a clue. Their name for cassia is Da Chini, the bark of China. In the search for the source of cassia, the possibility emerges of a remarkable link stretching back along what later would become the famous Silk Route, back through Persia to Kashgar, further east still through the dry heart of Asia to China, whose southern provinces have been known to grow cassia since before records began. Guilin. The city is set in the midst of what seems like a Chinese painting. Its lakeside restaurant on the site of an ancient moat boasts a display of wonderfully elaborate dishes, many dependent upon cassia. Cassia was mentioned in Chinese literature 5,000 years ago at the very dawn of civilization. The bark from older trees comes in pieces thicker and more irregular than cinnamon. This restaurant's spice grinding mortar is a relic from pre-electric days. This aromatic chore is a thing of the past, but what the cook is preparing is still very much in use. It's five spice powder, or more if you like. Fixed rules are foreign to Chinese cooking. Cassia is a standard ingredient. So are cloves and star anise. The exact mix for any dish depends on the cook's judgment. Five spice is rarely used in the instant stir-fry method of Chinese cooking, but it is in the longer processes of stewing and braising. Cooks like to keep it under control, either by sticking to small quantities or, as here, by placing it in a muslin bag that can be removed from the pot when the aroma has developed. Five spice helps take out the unwanted, strong flavour in foods. This meat is unusual enough. It's anteater. Lamb, which the Chinese regard as unusual, would be cooked in a similar way to play down its flavour. Further south, along the Likian River, which winds through this region, a group of fishermen set off to work. Without freshwater fish, the people in this part of China would go hungry. Cormorants. The birds are not here to steal the fishermen's catch, quite the opposite. There are no nets or hooks to be seen on these boats. Instead, it's the cormorants' fishing skills that are harnessed, quite literally. A bamboo strip is tied round their throat to prevent them swallowing. Hunger, definitely not satisfied, the cormorant goes fishing again, and again. It sounds horribly frustrating, but in fact the birds are quite tame. When the strings are released, they wait around to be fed a share of the catch at the end of the session. Home for these fisher people is a houseboat. Inside it is fish from today's catch that the family will eat tonight deep fried so that the skin is crisp and the flesh soft. With them, there's a simple sauce flavoured with pieces of Chinese cassia. But the first ingredient is soy, the most basic flavouring in Chinese cooking. A splash is added to the boiling mixture of stock and the remnant of oil. Put in next is some wine leaves the sediment of rice wine. The cook uses these precious dregs to give the sauce a winey taste. Then a little sugar for sweetness and texture. Then the cassia for a rich aroma. The heat of the cooking draws out cassia's own essential oils. Simmered together, these ingredients combine to provide a sauce with a startling range of tastes for some of the freshest fish in China. A 
sprinkling of chopped spring onion tops, and the dish is ready for the table, or more precisely, the floor in the narrow space of the houseboat. As always in China, one dish alone does not make a meal. It's not every family that can enjoy fish pulled fresh out of the river by their own tamed cormorants. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. Here King Solomon was warning the young men of Israel of dangerous temptations of sensuous women. He should know. His affair with the Queen of Sheba became a legend of voluptuous lovemaking. As the Bible says, never was there any such spice as the Queen of Sheba gave King Solomon. If the Queen of Sheba could reappear in present-day Austria, she might be touched to find that a small afterglow remains from her satisfying experience of long ago. The Salzburg Spice Posy, traditionally exchanged between lovers and containing cinnamon. So, cinnamon is the spice of warmth and love. Just right to perfect the comfort of friends, especially here in New Orleans on Halloween. <laughs> oh, too much. I think I'm looking out of my nose. <laughs> Spices add the magic to so many hot alcoholic drinks, like this Café Brulo. And believe me, it is difficult for a grapefruit to be peeled by a gorilla. So we're going to get this grapefruit peeled by a Louisiana Frenchman. Now, let's see if we're ready to flambe and burn. Mm, smell the clothes. I wonder if somebody could go into the kitchen and bring me some nice fresh coffee in one of those little silver coffee pots. Now that we've done the glow, we're ready for our next spices, cinnamon. This is like magic on Halloween. some delightful fresh coffee to put out the fires. Now this is going to be sweet. It's expected to be sweet because we're from Louisiana that produces a lot of sugar. And we use sugar in most of the things we do. Our candies are very sweet candies. And our drinks are very sweet drinks. Like any people, we try to utilize what we have available to us. And now, Café Brulot. For you. Letty, you be first. So, cinnamon stimulates all the senses. It's warm, it's sensuous, it speaks of love even lust. Life could drag on, I suppose, without it. But it wouldn't be nearly so much fun, would it? Next Wednesday at 7, The Spice of Life explains the origin and the history of pepper.
The pepper trade brought great wealth to the city of Venice, and Marco Polo ventured over land to the Far East in search of the spice. For a savory look at a popular seasoning, watch The Spice of Life next Wednesday at 7 on TV Ontario.